I've always been like a little entrepreneur at heart. But in high school, one of my best friends and I, we started a clothing business. So we'd go to Goodwill because we were always at Goodwill anyway. And we would buy clothing that we thought was pretty cool. And then we would we would shoosh it up. And so we would like dye things or have a little sewing kit. And then we fell so deeply in love with all the things that we made that we like put this crazy price on it. Right? We're like, how much is this worth? Well, to us, it was worth like $300 because we put so much work into it and we liked things so much. So uh, we our business tanked right away because everything was super overpriced. But that was like my first taste of creating things that I felt really passionate about and then attempting to sell them. And um, from there, it's been, oh, I, I don't know, I've, it's been trying a bunch of different ventures, but that was like kind of my first real venture. But um, yeah, just in general, I grew up in the Midwest in Illinois, so I'm very friendly. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I went to school in Orlando, which is how I met Jen, which is how Cody and I connected um, from a family friend. And yeah. And, and from there, after I graduated, started my first business and I've kind of been rolling. And when you were, you know, like coming up high school, whatever, did you think I might have a normal career? I might have like a typical, like I'll go to college, I'll, I'll get a normal nine to five. Or was it always pretty clear to you that no, nah, I'm going to do my own thing? So I was always like really all or nothing. I think I, I don't know when I really knew it was going to become a, like an, like a full on, like I'm going to have a crazy job and I'm going to live in a bunch of different countries and that sort of thing. I think I really knew when I had an internship in college and I was working for a pest control company and I was like, this life is not for me. But even as a little kid, like I was really weird and I'd like to like make videos and be creative. I would walk around my house in like strange outfits and try to listen to like fake gospels that I would write out. So I don't know, maybe it was always destined, I think, but I didn't really know until I felt like the the prison of the nine to five that this isn't for me. And oh gosh, there's like, the world is really your oyster if you decide that it can be. So coming out of college, I know you went to university, you went to Rollins with Jen. Yeah. You have to pay the bills somehow. Did you have like any type of a part-time job or was entrepreneurship just already paying the bills at that point? Oof, no, it was not. <laughs> it wasn't for a while. So um, after I graduated, I moved back in with my parents and then I got a job bartending and or like as a, you know, like a therapist, they say bartender slash therapist. <laughs> and uh, I worked to save up enough money to be able to first move overseas. And uh, my best friend and I, we went to different schools. We both knew that we wanted to build a company together, like do something after we graduated that wasn't the nine to five. And so we, we thought about a lot of things and um, we decided we we're going to start a travel company uh, for women in Vietnam. And that in itself was a long story. I studied the Vietnam War as a history major and I led a, a field study as a student my senior year. I postponed my graduation to be able to lead this this trip abroad. And so I'd made a connection there in Vietnam and I fell in love with the country. And then the booking agent that my professor hired, like, I felt like, oh, I've got a connection there. We could start this travel company and get other women to come with us on these boutique travel tours. And we were crazy enough to think that we could do it. <laughs> so, and we did it. But uh, yeah, so we graduated, we worked and we saved up like 10 grand. And then we were like, okay, let's, let's, let's do this. And she'd never been outside the country before. So we actually, I was like, well, you got to get a taste of what travel is really like before we start this travel company. So we went to Sri Lanka first, backpack all of Sri Lanka. And then from there, went to Vietnam and then start planning out our first tour. And what was the business model? Like, what were you going to actually offer people? What were you selling? Yeah, so we sold, we found there was a market for a lot of single women wanted to travel, even if they were maybe married, but they, their husbands didn't want to do these kind of more out there trips. And they were willing to go alone, but they wanted to go with a group. So either it's, Women wanted to go throughout their husbands, single women, mom and daughter duos, that sort of thing, who would, didn't feel comfortable traveling alone, but wanted something outside of the status quo, like just going to Cabo or something. So we knew there was a market and I'd seen other businesses doing really well. Um, and I loved Vietnam and I felt like there was this 
anyway, I'm getting off topic here. So our model was really, we knew that there was a market for it, but we had really didn't have a clue of what we were doing. So <laughs> our model in the beginning was like, okay, let's plan out a tour and then let's, let's market it to as many people as we can. And we know, and it was all bootstrapped and, uh, really just like deciding that we were going to do it. And we didn't have a good business model, to be honest. We just had grit <laughs> and determination. <laughs> So it sounds like this business wasn't too, too successful. And was this like yeah. before Airbnb experiences and all that? Cause we actually just talked to someone recently who just, this sounds like the perfect thing for an Airbnb experience. Like women's group trip in Vietnam was, what was your marketing strategy at this point? And how did the company end up kind of fizzling out if it did? I think the big thing is we really didn't understand branding and marketing. So we had a really, really good trip plan. Like I still to this day think it's like the the best Vietnam trip you could get because we had all like these local guides that were really amazing. And you, it was this really authentic experience where we'd like have our friends host people and cook dinner. So it was almost kind of like an Airbnb experience before Airbnb experiences um, and us taking people around. So, um, but, but yeah, we just didn't understand like how to, how to market it in general. I think a lot of entrepreneurship for me in the beginning has been, like diving into something and trying and, and learning along the way. And for us, we had no set up like financial plan. We didn't have a branding guide of understanding like who is our ideal client? Where are they hanging out? Where should we be advertising to them? All of that was sort of in the back burner. We tried to do everything on our own. And I think if we would have hired on somebody that was a marketing expert, we'd have done a lot better, but we were wanting to do everything alone. And so just ended up being I wouldn't say it wasn't a disaster, but it just, it ended up being <laughs> not something that we, uh, we were really like dedicated to enough that we pursued it as it was kind of like, oh, this is hard to get people to come on these trips. Um, are we going to keep doing it or not? And we know you didn't stop there. We know that wasn't the last business venture. So what was the next one that came through? Oh, okay. Let's see. Um, <laughs> I, so many. <laughs> yeah, I've done a, a few things. Um, well, while I was, while we were running this company or building up this company, a guided misdirection, MISS, we had also been teaching ESL online. And so it, used, it was this huge industry. It actually died quite recently, maybe a little less than a year ago. China banned all of their extracurricular activities and things. So um, I'm not teaching ESL online, but that's probably the niche I would still be in now if that hadn't gone away. Um, but we were teaching English online for the same company that, well, the company we were with then was called VIP Kid, about over 100,000 teachers in the U.S. And um, that was kind of our way of making income while we were building up this business. And I'd seen a lot of teachers doing referring. And so what you do is you would tell other people about this job where you're making like 20, 25 bucks an hour from anywhere. Don't have to write any curriculum, all Wi-Fi based. So great for digital nomads. So people would get on YouTube and they start sharing about it. And so I saw a lot of people doing it for this one company. I thought, oh, the man, I wish I could do that. That would be really cool if it could be me. And I didn't think there was room for me. So I didn't start. And then I found a job with another ESL company that was newer and I got on YouTube and I started referring. So that became another business that I started where I referred teachers to the first one ESL company and then a bunch of other ESLs and ESL companies in general um, and built up a business with a really small YouTube channel that I still have to this day. And obviously it's like my main thing to doing YouTube, teaching YouTube. Um, but I found loads of success in referring and helping people get jobs teaching English online. And it's been so fun. So that one's still going on right now. And just for a quick definition, could you define ESL for the listeners who don't know? Yes. ESL is um, English as a second language. So teaching English to kids, so that's their second language. So mostly I was working with kids in China. Okay. Awesome. Just wanted to get that definition out there. So you start making money, you're doing all these ESL programs. It sounds like you ended up getting booted you ended up getting booted off of one when it shut down, went to another one, went to another one. I was checking out your YouTube channel. You have videos on like multiple platforms. It seems like you're just crushing it in that area. Was that the first video you ever created? I know you mentioned young Danny was like <laughs> dressing up weird and listening to gospel, but what was the first like <laughs> quote unquote real YouTube video you launched? Yes. So the first <laughs> video that I ever made um, that like, yeah, the first video I ever did was for this company, GoGo Kid, which is obviously it's it's 
died now since trying to pass this law, but they're actually owned by the same company that owns TikTok, ByteDance. So uh, they own like all my like AI, I think probably now somehow. But uh, <laughs> so I I found out about this GoGo Kid company and I like immediately saw, I'm like, this could be something. It's like when you find a hole in the market, right? I'm like, I found a hole in the market. This company looks really solid. It looks very similar to this other one and nobody knows about it yet. And so I found the job listing on Facebook. I applied for the job and got the job all in like one sitting. I did the interview. There was like an interview like 30 minutes from when I was sitting there. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I clicked. I'm gonna, I did this interview, got the job. And right after that, I literally sat down on the floor with my laptop on the bed. And I made my first YouTube video talking about GoGo -Go Kid because I'm like, you know what? I didn't feel comfortable. Like I could do it about this other company. There were too many people doing it. There is such an opportunity. This is going to be my first video. And so, yeah, it was really bad. And I have a panda puppet. I'm pretty sure I'm using. I know definitely in my first or second video, I've got my panda puppet because you're like, it's yeah, it's English as a second language. You're t you're working with kids, right? So I'm a hot mess. Like, my, you know, yeah, I get audibly, at least I can tell, flushed at one point because I'm embarrassed. You know, you're putting yourself out there. So that was the first video I ever put out, and it's been great ever since. But yeah, <laughs> the journey. And it's just a little spot check. I know you, before you were in Vietnam and you were, you know, when you're getting that travel company started up and I know you still travel a ton of places. Are you still traveling at that time or had you come back to the U.S. and kind of tried to hunker down to get something next started? Yeah, no, I spent like once I moved, once I went overseas after saving up that chunk of money, I pretty much stayed in Vietnam. So even after we, when we didn't have as many tours running, I was still in Vietnam living there. I, I Oof, if, if any of the listeners have never been to Vietnam, it is so amazing. Um, the food's great. It's the cost of living is very low. Everyone's friendly. So even uh, like COVID, I was stuck in the States. But as soon as I could, I went back to Vietnam. Um, I, the only reason I'm back here now is because I got dengue fever in Bali. So I came home for a little bit, but I'll be back overseas soon. Um, but yeah, for a long time, Vietnam was home. Hanoi was home for me. And now, like I was saying to you earlier, I feel like I'm a little bit homeless and kind of just a little wanderer. But yeah, mostly all of these businesses building in Asia or just on the go. Like I've, I've kind of either I'm with my family, uh, like in the northern California, Nevada or Chicago um, or overseas. So before we kind of get into the Danny YouTube era where you start crushing it on YouTube, I do want to focus in on kind of the point where you move over, you're teaching ESL, you're living in Vietnam. Could we go over some of those numbers? Like what was your like monthly rent? How much are you spending on food? And then also from the income side, if we can get into that, like what is the ceiling on what you can make as an ESL teacher? Like let's say you're willing to grind, you know, 60, 80 hours a week. Is it like a living wage or do you have to get another job on top of that? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So monthly rent that I was paying in Vietnam at the time, I think I had a, I had an apartment there for three fifty, and it was fully furnished. One bedroom came with the maid once a week. What? Wow. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. So you can even get cheaper than that. And, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, we stayed I, before when my partner, um, uh, my business partner and I started our first company, we lived in this like really, really bougie apartment and it was, 900 a month but there were three of us and it was three bedroom also came with the maid once a week yes i'm telling you vietnam is awesome uh and so i don't even know i couldn't tell you like meals there or maybe local meals are like 90 cents sometimes less than that sometimes i was paying 50 cents because i'm a vegetarian back then i wasn't though so a little bit more but pretty similar um so really my cost of living was crazy low so when i was teaching esl online you're making about 20, 25 bucks an hour. I, I could live off of like next to, you know, I could work only a couple hours a day and I was totally fine. Uh, but yeah, when, once I started referring, I started seeing like, oh, I really felt that, wow, this is what it's like when money can just work for you. And I'd wake up to a couple, you know, $400 because four, four people that night had taught their first class. So I'd gotten paid a commission for those new teachers. And so that's when I first felt like, ooh, I can make more money here, but in the beginning, yeah, people in the ESL world, it's like when you're trading your time for money. So I think you can make decent money teaching English online, but what I found a lot of teachers doing is if you're independent, you can have a higher rate. So that's what a lot of teachers are doing now that working like maybe for 40 to 50 bucks an hour and nobody takes a cut. 
because you're getting your own students, which in itself is, you know, you've got to be marketing things, so that can take time. Uh, but I found then some teachers like me then we were like, well, we'll refer teachers. So we teach less and we're making more passive income. But I think it's a great option for like a side gig for people who love kids and you like teaching curriculum. I've got a couple of friends that they teach others how to have like full time businesses and it can be something quite lucrative. Um, but again, it's like it's capped to hourly. So for me, I think it's great for a little bit, but you always want that other thing that can be growing that has no scale on the side. <laughs> And everybody may not be doing ESL, but there's probably a lot of things that folks listening could do that ref that have to do with referrals. And so I'm wondering, like, when you first got started with that, is there any lessons learned you think would be good for the audience to hear around how to get people to actually sign up for your referral versus just, like, going to the random website or whatever it is, like, you know, circumventing your referral? That I love that question. That's such a yes, because I, I found that what people really want and what I think allowed me to stand out in a market that then did become pretty saturated with teachers also referring is being super honest about products. And so there's two parts of that. First, you need to pick products that have affiliate or referral programs. So um, if you are in between two products that you're trying to decide in your business and you can't really decide, pick the one that has the better <laughs> referral program because or affiliate program and which one's gonna pay you a higher commission because if you're building up your brand or you're gonna be recommending things, it's, it's a it's a win-win for for you so I think that's one thing is being really smart about the products that you use um, and of course you know there's some products I love and use they don't have any affiliate and that's fine but being able to kind of have that on the side of the world most of them do have affiliate links that's nice especially if you're building a personal brand and then the second thing with that is being super honest like I was saying about if you like it or not if the things you do like and you don't like and that's the one thing when I was sharing about these ESL companies I was brutally honest like does this company and their policies like not is it not so good sometimes i would always share the negatives and my honest opinion and sometimes that got me in trouble like i was not the crowd favorite of the actual companies a lot of times but i had so many referrals they couldn't they like couldn't deny me but i knew a lot of them didn't like a couple of them too they didn't like me as much because i i wouldn't be a puppet for them and i think that's really important and i think people see through that and so if you're getting on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube to share about things and doing these review videos, the, the most honest ones are going to be the ones that usually have the highest conversion rate I found, especially in my videos. And so was that your main traffic source? Was it YouTube or was this predating YouTube when you started getting these referrals? No, this was all YouTube. Um, it was amazing. Hmm. So I, 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 I hacked the YouTube SEO strategy. So I figured out, okay, how can I get my video? I always want my video to be shown up first, second, or third. You, I mean, you want to be that first video, right? But if you could be top three, you knew that that video was going to make you a lot of money because I want my video when somebody's to thinking of a company, they're thinking, okay, you know, is, let's say they're looking up GoGo Kid, a company that I work for, is GoGo Kid legit? Well, I want to be the video that shows up as like, is GoGo Kid legit? Is it a scam? Everything you need to know about GoGo Kid. That needs, if I know people are typing that in, that needs to be my title and I want to be that first person showing up. And so that's what I did. And that's why everything was pretty much from YouTube. I did a little bit of Instagram, but honestly, because YouTube is a search engine, that's where people were going to figure out about how that they could have this job that like, I knew that that's where I needed to be. And so that's where I spent all my time and it really paid off. I had even at one point, I think, you know, and I even had, a thousand subscribers, I could retire from teaching ESL if I wanted to. Like, I didn't really need to teach at all anymore. I could just, I could, my, my income from those referrals was enough to be like, I'm all good. Granted, I was in Vietnam, so if I was in the States, like, maybe not, you know, I have to, I gotta be teaching more hours. But in Vietnam, I was like, shoot, I don't like, what time is it today? It's 12 o'clock, I'm off, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> and what were you tactically doing to figure out what you should title YouTube videos, what you should put in the description? Like, how do you, you know, hack the SEO, like you said. Yes. So in the beginning, it's a lot of, it's a lot of trial and error and figuring out like what's working for other people. So in the beginning, I started doing a lot of competitor research, like what are, what are the top videos? What are those titles and, and why do they work? So I, I would look at who are the top people in this industry and what do I feel like, what are they doing well? And I would, I would look at their titles and you'll see on YouTube, you'll notice if you look up something and you see a bunch of like a very popular topic, you'll see almost 
Not always, but depending on the, the subject, most people have like the same exact title almost because there's something about it that's working. And so that's a thing too, where someone will have a video pop off and people will take that same title and kind of they either use the same exact title or they'll make it just a little bit different. So a lot of competitor research, and I think that's important for people getting on YouTube, don't necessarily watch the videos, but look and analyze what they put in their title and their description, all these things, and you can learn a lot. And then I also, uh, I, you know, I watch actually a lot of YouTube to learn YouTube. And um, I, I took a course on blogging that also really helped. Blogging and ranking on Google search is very similar to showing up on YouTube search. And then I also use a plugin called TubeBuddy. And that really helped as well in learning, okay, what keywords or long tail keywords, which are longer phrases that someone would actually type in to search for what you're creating. So I would say, all right, what are the suggestions that TubeBuddy has of like what people are actually looking up? So there's some really good resources that people can use like TubeBuddy. Um, I love Keywords Everywhere is another good one. I think I even have that one on my computer right now. I think, yeah, that's what it is. Um, yeah, Keywords Everywhere, I don't know if you guys use, but that one's that one's really awesome. Um, even like looking and seeing what, what does Google Trends say is working right now and, and um, that sort of a thing, yeah. So it's a lot of trial and error, market research, using TubeBuddy, all of that. And so when someone's starting out on YouTube, or I guess you can use your own story as an example, do you recommend just like really staying honed into a certain niche or just using these tools that you're talking about, like TubeBuddy and Keywords Everywhere to kind of just like hit the popular things in a bunch of different niches? So I would say I tell my clients, we find a really specific target audience. So it's not, it, it's, it, of course, I want you to have a niche, right? But I really want you to be talking to like one specific type of person. So if you can understand like deeply, who is specifically the one person you're talking to, then you don't have to have like as small of a niche as as we used to say that you would need on YouTube, right? If you are these things that that one person would be interested in. But I do think in the beginning that it is important. If the more you niche down to a very specific topic, the easier it is to grow. Because let's say like I want to get on YouTube and I want to be a yoga instructor, that there's too much competition. There, I, there's no way that your video is ever going to, like it's just nearly impossible. There's a reason why we know about who were all the top YouTubers. It's because it's not super common to like just make it right away on YouTube. Usually, even like Mr. Beast, right? Like it took him like, what is it? Like 10 years or something to like build up. So um, really slow and steady growth is the key to YouTube, but it's just, it's so worth it because you can make a lot of money and build that community. Um, but I'm sorry, I've gone on a bit of a tangent here. No, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> wind me back in. What was I, what was, where was I going with that again? Um, we were talking about picking a niche. Right, okay. So, um, so if you were to start with something like yoga, obviously that's too broad. So like I tell my clients, let's say if you were to start a channel on um, postnatal yoga, that's way more specific, right? Now you've got like a much smaller group of women. And so who's that person you're talking to? That's maybe a woman who uh, just had her, 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 had a baby and is trying to like, you know, so, so think of the specific person that you want to talk to and what are the specific things that that person would look up that's going to be helpful. So yeah, I do think you need a niche. And if you don't want to niche yourself, because I know entrepreneurs, like they never want to put themselves in a box, uh, then you at least need to be really, really specific. Like you need to know the age of the person, you know, the likes of that person. You need to know what is a general reason why they're coming to you, all of these things in order to really scale a community. Because if not, right, if you talk to everybody, you're talking to nobody, and that super applies to YouTube as well. And I know a lot of times when we talk to people, especially like social media or blogging, it's always just be consistent, like keep putting content out there. Obviously, you want it to be good, but consistency is always a big thing. Is that as important as YouTube that you're constantly putting out videos? Thank goodness it is not as bad as TikTok. Do you see recently people <laughs> are like, you need to put out five videos a day. I'm like, in what world? <laughs> no. So YouTube, yes, you do want to be consistent, but... I even say to my clients, like, can you put out a video, a long video every other week? Wonderful. Every other week is all you really need. And now with people consuming so much content, like sometimes even one video a week from your favorite creators feels like a lot. You're like, oh shoot, they've got another video out. Like <laughs> it feels, you know, so one video every other week is enough to continue to grow, like to scale. 
your channel. And then what we've been doing is YouTube shorts. There's so much growth potential. I know even message Cody about YouTube shorts. Like, are you putting these on YouTube shorts? Cause I love <laughs> your Instagram reels, but, um, we'll, what we'll do is we'll put one Instagram short. Um, I'm sorry, one YouTube short or two, the weeks that you don't put out a YouTube video. And so that's, that's like really doable, right? Can you get out one under 60 second video a week? And then the next week, can you get out one like five to 10 minute video? And especially if you have an editor, like it's really doable to grow. And the big kicker here is that your videos show up in search for years, potentially. So it's not like TikTok where it's like, I'm going to put a video every other day and then goodbye in the algorithm. Like <laughs> it's the best thing ever. I've got videos from years ago that still show up in search and it's almost overwhelming because ESL is not my niche anymore. So I have constant DMs of being like, can you help me teach English online? And I'm like, I can't, I'm so sorry. No, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's the power of YouTube. That's awesome. So going back to Justin's question about like the quantity over quality thing. I mean, it would be easy to, you probably could pump out five YouTube videos if you took like a one minute unedited thing on your phone and just threw it up there. But is there like a rule of thumb when it comes to how well edited or just like how well put together a video should be? Obviously you probably don't want to spend like 20 hours editing a one minute video, but you also don't want to just like throw up a random video that's horrible because it's not going to work. Is there like a happy right. medium? Yeah, I would say what the content is always going to be more important than the quality of editing in the video. So if you are sharing it, it's got to have a good hook. So like nobody cares about you, right? They care about like how you can help <laughs> them, especially if this video is supposed to go into a search engine, people want to answer their question. Um, so if you can create a video that's answering a question and it's you, you're and like, kind of, you're, you're not like, if you're awkward, like cool, be awkward, but you know, like you're being yourself in the video and you're, you're sharing something helpful. Boom. You don't need crazy good editing because you've got the components of a magnetic brand, right? It's helpful. It's getting to the point and it's you. So it's unique. Um, but I think as you put out more content, it's just going to get your editing. It's going to get better and all of these things. So I would say things though, that are just like thrown together and it's not serving your business in a very specific way. Like people that throw out content, just put out content like, Oh, well, you know, it's Wednesday. I need to put out a video. Mm -mm, no, like, wait, wait to make sure is this talking to your ideal person? Is it serving your business in some way? Like for, you'll notice if you go to my channel, I always am trying to get people on my email list. The first 30 seconds, I'm like, by the way, be sure to grab my go viral video guidebook and real quick. And then we get into the video, but like, I want you to be, you know, it's, this video needs to serve you in a specific way. So make sure that I think you need that strategy. Don't just put out content to put out content. Yeah. I think quality is always going to be more important. There are some YouTubers that put out a video like once a year, right? And they still do well. <laughs> Obviously that's not probably people in your, our niche, but yeah, you don't need to, I think it's this content hamster wheel that we're all on. And I think the more you can think like, is this serving well? And like, does it serve me? Then put it out. And if not, then like, it's okay to take some days off from social media. I think along the same line of quality, a, a, a thing that would stop people from jumping in and kind of keep putting it off is feeling like, I don't have the right equipment. Obviously, cameras on like your phones and stuff have gotten so much better. Would you recommend somebody just grabbing like a, like a DJI Osmos or something like a stabilizer for a cell phone and keep it simple? Or is there certain kind of equipment that you would recommend people getting? Yeah, I told them like, keep it super simple. You, if you got the iPhone 13, like, you're good. Use your iPhone. Just make sure you're doing it horizontal. I've had a client once who filmed a first whole video vertical and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, but you got to redo the whole thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think you, the, the, the misconception again is that you have to have like all this fancy equipment or to have a really, and, and even editing software to have a really successful channel. And like, I can tell you from personal experience, that is not the case at all. Do you have something helpful to share? Yes film the video on your iPhone, get, if you need a mic, um, like the snowball mic is a great one. It's, I think it's like 40 bucks. It's pretty cheap. Um, right now, like even using, I started my channel with an external, like a Logitech camera those you can get even secondhand for like 40 bucks. So, uh, you don't need a fancy setup. You just need something helpful to share. And I know we talked earlier about how affiliates were kind of the start of your YouTube money generation and but there's there's tons of other ways to make money on youtube so i was wondering for the listeners out there if you could kind of just go through like all of the awesome ways that you can make money with youtube because yes. i think a lot of people don't even realize that there's that many 
For sure. Okay. So, um, the best way to make money from your channel is to like pull people, new clients into your business. Right. So that's like indirectly, but that's a huge way that I have my one client who's like her whole business. Now, all of her clients come to her from YouTube. Amazing. So, because if your ideal client is looking up for questions, if you can be that person answering questions, boom, they're probably going to hire you on. Um, so just getting your name out there, but also then there's YouTube ad revenue and, and, uh, even I just got an email the other day from YouTube saying that they're now going to have ad revenue apply to YouTube shorts. So, so cool. Like what other social media does that? No other social media. Um, it's not like a fund where they're giving it to creators. It's like actual ad money that you can make now. So for me, I have 13,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel and I make about a little over 400 bucks a month from YouTube ads, which is like, and if I wanted to be, if I wanted to increase that, I could, I could put more ads in the middle of my videos. But for me, I more want my videos to, to funnel into my business. So I don't do that as often. But if I wanted to increase that, I could by putting more ads in. I just choose not to. Um, so that doesn't suck, right? Like a little extra cash in the wallet. Um, and what's cool is that it scales, right? As your business, as your channel grows, that ad revenue will grow as well. Um, you can also make money, like we said, from affiliate links. So you'll see in your favorite creators, they'll have those links in the bottom of like the equipment they use and all those things or recommending different products. So you can make some good money there. Um, and, and doing review videos is a great way to do that. Now I'm making like probably, I'd say about five to 600 bucks a month. I'll make from just one Kajabi, one Kajabi video I had because I'm recommending the product. People use my link from that I'm on YouTube and then I make affiliate income on that. So that's another way. Um, you can also get sponsorships. You can do this again, even if you have a small channel, if it's, if it's niche into something specific, so people see you as an expert on that, then some companies, and you can even reach out to companies and say, would you like to sponsor a video? I just recently did that with one company. Would you like to sponsor a video? I had another company who's gonna sponsor my video next month, um, where a company will actually pay you to create a video and then you shout them out within it and you talk a little about what they stand for. And you'll kind of think of the outline of that video together and you can make a lot of money from it. You know, you could make anywhere from a hundred bucks to in the thousands, depending on um, you know, how the company and also how much of an extra expert you're seeing in your channel. Um, let's see. There are other ways as well. I need to think. Um, we've got affiliate <laughs> links, AdSense, clients, sponsorships. sponsorships. Um, what else? It's just also I, like, I will. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, I guess like one that's coming to my mind is your own products. Like whether exactly. if you could like bring them into your business, like if you're a coach or something, but you could also have like an ebook or a mini course or just like other pro or even merch. I know some big YouTubers make a ton yeah, of merch. Yeah, yeah, merch. <laughs> yeah, you can sell merch. That's true too. Um, once you hit 10K, you are able to have merch. I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to start making some hats and put them on my channel. And uh, and yeah, I think the biggest thing though is really the, the big kicker is getting money into your own business. So your own clients, your own products. Uh, by because it's a search engine, it's just so powerful. And a lot of people aren't willing to do it. They're not willing to put the time into YouTube when it doesn't have to be as, time, to, as time consuming as people think. And there's just so many different ways that you can be making money off of it. Like so many different streams of income. So fun. Get on YouTube. <laughs> I think the message is loud and clear. People need to get on YouTube and because you've been mentioning all the great things you've been doing, like the successful things, but just as important are, you know, the mistakes, the things that you were wasting time on. So that would be something I'd be interested in. What's something that you found yourself putting a lot of time and effort into that just didn't have enough return for you to keep doing it? Hmm. Just good at everything. So, yeah, I, I think... <laughs> For me in my business in the beginning, I try to do, I try to do both on YouTube. So I, or both in my ESL referral business, I tried to be on YouTube and also be on Instagram. And because I saw other people on Instagram, I felt like I, I needed to be when it really didn't serve my business that much at all. So it's a big waste of time. I could have been putting out more content on YouTube instead of worrying about like, what was my Instagram following and, and, and you know, looking at vanity metrics. I think that's a big thing. And I hear it a lot from even clients who they're like, oh, well, I needed to get more views. Vanity metrics don't matter when you're using platforms that are search engines. Are you showing up for that very specific thing? If someone were to Google it, like YouTube it, would it show up? If it does, then that's all that really matters is like your ideal people are seeing it. You know, I've had one client, her video had 300 views, three clients have come from that video. 
high ticket clients. So I think the big thing is I used to worry a lot about vanity metrics and I'd worry about how many subscribers I had and growing my other social media platforms, but it just really didn't matter. And if I would have focused on one thing in the beginning, rather than trying to do all the things, I know my channel would be double or quadruple what it is now. So I think that's a lesson a lot of entrepreneurs learn is we want to do all the things in the beginning where I'm really taking one thing at a time is like master something and then move on to the next. And so once I really mastered YouTube, then I moved on to Instagram and now that's done well. But um, it took me not having to have any brain power on YouTube, like I'd, all the brain power put in, I'd created a system and then I could move on and have success in something else. And speaking of Instagram and just other social medias in general, are there best practices when it comes to repurposing content? Like, is there a best way to do it? Because obviously all the platforms are different. The tags are different. Like how are you going to present the content slightly different, but you know, we all have limited time. So what's the easiest way to like repurpose a, you know, 15 minute YouTube video that's like widescreen. Then there's all these like really high frequency social media platforms, like the TikToks and the Instagram reels and even YouTube shorts now. Yeah, I would say for, for me, at least, of course, every platform is a bit different, right? But I've noticed that if I'm creating content that is helpful in answering specific questions and still pretty engaging, right? It flows and it's fast. I can create one video and put it on YouTube shorts, Instagram reels, and TikTok, and they'll all do the pretty good. And usually there'll be one platform where it does like really good and the other is like, oh, it's okay, but it's still serving my business. I'm happy with it, right? Um, so... I think the best way is probably like you, TikTok needs to be a little bit more uh, like, you're just a fly on the wall. Like this is me, live my life, I'm so casual. And then YouTube Shorts is like a little bit more put together and Instagram is just like trying to be TikTok, right? So I don't know, they're, they're obviously sometimes you wanna show up in different ways, but for me, like who's got the time? Um, now for my, the way I repurpose is I will really take time with one video and knowing like, is this what my ideal client avatar w is, is struggling with and is needing to know? Yes. Okay. Then I'm going to film that on my phone and then I edit it on InShot. I add captions through the captions app. Um, it takes like maybe two minutes to add captions if I want to do that. And then boom, I've got a video that I can put out on three different platforms. And with shorts, YouTube shorts, you can actually schedule them out. So that's how I've been doing my content. And I feel like it's really like, I'm really liking that. Um, I know with Instagram, pulling people like having content that's more entertaining does really well for reels and so i think i tell my clients like when you feel in the mood to like make these funny reels have some that you you could we have lists of ones that are trending so like go ahead and make one of those but those aren't really like those can grow your they can grow your following but there's not really what's going to convert in the end what's going to convert in the end are the ones that are probably a little bit less views but more targeting that ica so that's how I repurpose. I don't know if it's the best way, but that's how I do it. And you were just talking about some of the, the tools that you're using. And like earlier, we talked about equipment, but that was actually what I was going to ask next is some of the tools that maybe people who are wanting to get into this should look out for, or give a shot or give a try to, whether it be adding graphics to their screen, you know, making little animations pop up. Like a lot of YouTube videos you see have things popping up on top of their video. Like what are some of your favorite tools that you use for editing the video or, or adding a little little flair. Yes. So for YouTube videos specifically, I recommend for new YouTubers, if you have an Apple product, just use iMovie. And if you have a PC, use Filmora or just use Filmora with either one. Filmora seems to be the most user friendly. I, I don't use Filmora. I use Final Cut Pro, but Final Cut Pro is like a little bit more robust and it can be overwhelming to, to, to start out editing in. So Filmora is like, yeah, it's wonderful. There's loads of different um, animations and things you can just like easily drag in. You don't need to be a video editor to understand how to do it. And there's great tutorials on YouTube. So um, I recommend to do that. But if you're using, let's say for shorts, I like editing on InShot. Of course, you can still edit on your desktop. Um, but lately I haven't had as much time. So I'll just do it within InShot and I'll add some like little graphics within it that come along with it. And then I'll use captions, a captions app. Now InShot, you, if you don't want to, I always recommend like invest the money into these things. They're not super expensive. Um, in chat, I think is only like maybe like 50 bucks a year. And then captions the same. I think it's like 54 bucks a year. But if you're creating content pretty consistently, it's super worth the time that it saves you. And so I can imagine when you first started all of this, Danny, that you were doing everything yourself, like every single entrepreneur. But I know I've heard you talk about you have a VA at this point. So 
what at this at this stage in your business, what are you doing yourself and what do you outsource to your virtual assistant? Yeah, so my VA is um she's like more than the VA. She's like <laughs> I, I don't know how to describe it. We any yeah. Alora is amazing and I hired her on like before I was ever ever ready to have a VA. And I remember when I hired her, I'm like, I have no clue like what what it what it should look like to have a VA. So we'll just like figure this out together. And it's been wonderful ever since. She does a lot of my she just does the things that I don't like to do. So uh, I hate creating like any sort of Instagram content that's not a video so she does all of that for me she's really wonderful at like taking my ideas and writing them in a way more just understandable (laughs) way she takes my squirrel brain and like (laughs) makes it i it's wonderful so she'll take a lot of my ideas and kind of help me map them out so at this point now she has really helped me with um even in like marketing too so like our sales pages as well that's something i didn't have the time to do so she made my whole last landing page for magnetic creator academy which is my youtube course um so she did all that so pretty much just anything i don't have time for anymore i've entrusted to her uh but the i think the most valuable thing in her being my va is she the ideas that we come up with together i feel like she's really she has a like, solid grasp of marketing and that's something i said like I would always share as much of my knowledge as I had with her. If I knew something, I was going to share it with her because like the more she knew, the more that we could do together. And so that's been really cool. Like now I feel like she knows even way more about marketing business than I do. Um, So she does that. And I'm actually looking to hire on somebody now who just does really basic uploading optimization for my clients. And then then I'll be able to just kind of look that over because that I've had, I've had a lot of clients graduate and now want me to just manage their channels. I don't have time for that. So I will have somebody doing the bulk of the SEO stuff. And then I'll just be kind of like looking over everything. You've talked about your clients a few times. Are you coaching all types of YouTubers or do you have a niche for what you're coaching? I do have a niche, right? I always want a niche, uh, but I have worked with like all types of clients, right? We, we attract into like one ideal person, but that doesn't mean we, we don't pull in the others. So I think that's always so nice. Um, I mainly work with now before I was mainly working with teachers. Uh, so a lot of ESL teachers are just brick and mortar school teachers building their channels, but now I've really gotten into health and wellness. So that's something I've always been like really passionate about. And the structure of being able to grow and brand yourself on YouTube, the overall strategy is it's all the same, right? Depending, it doesn't matter what niche you're in. We switch things up a bit when it comes to SEO, but really it works for everybody. So I decided who do I really want to attract, who I most enjoy work with. And that's we usually women in health and wellness. So I work with nutritionists, dietitians, I've got dentists, that sort of a thing. Um, so that those are mainly my clients kind of fit that, that niche, but I've had guys in real estate and, um, you know, people in, in other industries as well, but that, that is mainly my niche now helping them build out their brands and build client acquisition that funnel through YouTube. Love it. Well, Danny, we are nearing the end of our time together here. And for those who are interested in learning more about YouTube, maybe they want to get into Magnetic Creator Academy or just work with you. And it sounds like you're building out like this whole system. We're going to be helping people in managing their SEO. Where are the best places for people to stay in touch and keep up? Definitely. So you can send me a DM at Hey Danny J on Instagram. Check out my channel as well, Hey Danny J. And my website is also HeyDannyJ.com. So any one of those, you can hit me up. And um, unfortunately, I am on Instagram a lot. So if you DM me, I'll get back to you and you know, we can talk. <laughs> you can learn more about Magnetic Creator Academy on my website. Um, doors are closed right now, but they open up uh, about every six months. And um, yeah, it's an awesome way to really understand like the strategy to building a magnetic brand and then scaling through strategy on YouTube. Well, Danny, thank you so much for giving us some time. And I know uh, I'm excited to have our listeners get to hear us pick your brain and get a lot of tips from you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Start a YouTube channel. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> All right.